Well, welcome everyone. Um, Jason Lee here, Chair Elect of NAILBA 2021. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Really excited to have uh, my good friend Mark Peterson from AIG with us today and to share a little bit about uh, not only what's going on in AIG, uh, but some observations about the marketplace as well. And I wanted to say a couple of things about Mark. Uh, I'm sure he'll also share a little bit, but uh, I've known Mark a long time. Uh, I've, I've become uh, good friends with Mark over the years. Uh, he's been at AIG, believe it or not, for over eight years, which is hard to believe. Uh, he's been in the insurance business for 35 years um, and is currently the chief distribution officer uh, for AIG's U.S. life business and has, has been in that role for the past three and a half years. One fun thing uh, to know about Mark is that although he and his wife are empty nesters, uh, they have welcomed uh, wholeheartedly their 25-year-old uh, daughter back to the house for a little COVID respite in between uh, jobs. And Mark is, is happy to report that there's been absolutely uh, no conflict there at all. It's been complete and utter harmony the entire time. Uh, and uh, I think a lot of us can relate uh, to that, uh, that little story about Mark's family situation. Um, so uh, Mark, without further ado, um, anything else you'd like to say to, to kick this off before we dive in and welcome? Um, well, first of all, thank you. And uh, it's great to be here. Appreciate the chance to, uh, to come and um, spend some time with you and, and speak to the NELMA of membership. Um, you know, I guess the only thing I'd add is uh, I've had a chance in those 35 years, which I, I don't know how that happened, but um, to do a lot of different jobs and, and been able to take something from each of them and, and try to be better at what I do today. But uh, one of the things that I did was I was actually a, an agent for about four years and worked in an agency um, in the middle of my career. And I would tell you that was probably the most enlightening thing that I've ever done and um, have a lot of um, empathy and feel like I have good understanding of what uh, agents advisors go through as well as what distribution goes through from uh, interactions with carriers. So that's great. I mean, it's a, uh... It's good to have uh, stood in the shoes of your customers and distributors and uh, definitely has got to help bring a lot of perspective to the decisions you have to make. For sure. Um, all right, well, let's get after it. Um, so one of the things that I think is relevant to kick off and it's a good place to start off uh, this conversation is just to talk about 2020 for a minute. How has it been for, for AIG Life and Retirement and um what are your hopes for, for next year, for 2021? Yeah, that's, um, that's a good question. So, you know, I, I think when I look back at the beginning of 2020 and um, when we set our vision and, and strategy, one of the things we were really focused on was uh, restoring and enhancing the importance of life insurance really for, for everybody um, across the U.S. and wanted to empower people, um, you know, with peace of mind, uh, that protection brings to them and their families, whether that's early death or longevity or, or chronic illness. And one of the things that we did earlier this year uh, in advance of COVID was release the results of our uh, AIG Life Insurance IQ study, which was really kind of a test of Americans' knowledge and attitudes towards life insurance. And if anybody's interested in learning more, um, because it is very, very good general information. You can go to uh, AIG.com backslash life IQ. But the study, one of the things um, that it found was that 70% of Americans look at life insurance and equate it with um, really a long financially secure life. But yet half of the people don't have it. And we, we um, thought that was interesting because it leaves them and their families vulnerable to, to financial risk. So raising life insurance understanding is an important part of improving um, the country's overall financial and retirement uh, security. Um, the life insurance knowledge gap is one of the contributing factors, I think, to the um, coverage gap that we all talk about that's you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of $12 trillion and, and still growing. And um, we see that gap uh, particularly with middle and mass market who have the unmet needs. And so the plan was to continue 
to evolve um, the value proposition and focus on that market and have a strategy in place to support that vision and bring it to reality. And then the pandemic um, hit and the current environment in some ways um, might expedite um, some of the progress that we're able to make on that. And really just adapt, adaption and adoption in the life insurance industry and probably talk more about it in a little bit. Um, but it's really important to what we do and we're committed to the business in the long haul um, and paying claims that we've been doing in this uh, COVID environment is, is core to our business and um, you know, something that we're, we're happy to be able to do. Um, and it's, you know, it's really quite interesting because I think the industry hasn't really faced anything like this um, for, for more than a century. But I think the other thing that we've been really focused on is um, aspirations around operational excellence. And, you know, we know that technology can allow policies to be issued faster and underwritten faster, and it can be a different experience than traditional underwriting. And there's a lot of insurers who have technology in place um, to do that. And they've been at a competitive advantage in this environment um, because of that. And that's something that we're very focused on and, and something that we uh, plan to make improvements on. Um, one way that we've been doing it is expanding our automated um, underwriting program that's in place. And we have an underwriting engine that we refer to as ARIA and our version 2.0 has come out. There's a lot of new exciting data sources um, that allow us to expand that. So in the midst of the, the COVID crisis, um, we're really thoughtfully thinking about how we can expand the accelerated programs with the lower risk part of the population. So a lot of work has gone into that this year, and I think that'll drive a lot of our initiatives um, in 2021, as we also look at the digital process that goes with that and, and ultimately make it easier for distributors and advisors to, to serve that, that broader market. Um, we'll continue to as well in, improve, and we have this year, um, our in-force uh, capabilities and, and the customer service that we provide. So a lot of changes going on, um, and, and I know we'll talk more about COVID in a bit, but it's... Um, it's accelerated a lot of our plans and it's really validated a lot of the plans that we have in place around the vision of the business. Awesome. Um, where do you see the opportunities for innovation uh, coming into the life insurance industry? And, and you know, some of that could be products uh, that you guys see as well, what you're excited about on, on both innovation and the product front. Yeah, so, you know, in some ways, if you look at the marketplace, um, products have become more and more similar and, and, and uh, particularly in, in some of the peer protection products. And um, the, the real differentiator is, is coming down to, to price or it historically has. And the, the, I think there's a few things in that. One is that the existing product range can be a bit limited um, and we don't have offerings for everybody. So we're, we're spending a lot of time looking at that and, and how we can create some of these lifetime products for, for younger folks. Um, but, you know, really the, the path um, on the innovation starts with curiosity. And, um, you know, we're, we're kind of operating uh, from that standpoint and that we can't be afraid of, of what the future brings. So um, Obviously, we see a lot of new entrants coming in. We're seeing tech companies buying insurance companies, and we know that, that these are the things that they're looking at, and, and we need to do that as well um, to keep pace with them. So, you know, that type of innovation is going to be required for all of us to remain relevant as, as we go forward. Um, you know, we're also looking at some things, and, you know, recently we've our, our life business and our individual retirement business reports into a common CEO and, you know, discussions around how can we create hybrid products that bring um, the protection and, um, you know, the, the uh, mortality issues of life insurance together um, with some of the longevity issues that the annuity uh, type product solves. So a lot, lot of work going on in that area. That's, that's interesting. Uh, a hybrid annuity life product. Love to see more on that. Yes. Um, so the, uh, the elephant in the room, uh, COVID-19, uh, it is certainly something that had we done this a, a year ago uh, and you told 
anyone told either one of us that this is this is the reality we were going to be facing in November or December of 2020, I think we would have said that's impossible. Um, but here we are, and um, the the pandemic has left almost you know no industry or or, or any customer untouched by uh, the disruption that it brings. Um, has it impacted uh, you know the traditional approaches in business models in our industry, and and if so, how and what does that mean for the future of the business? Yeah, I think um, I think you're right. I think it is an elephant, and um, you know it's interesting. I was um, closing out a notebook a few weeks ago, and um, I was looking at what what did I write in the beginning of the notebook? What notes had I taken? And it was a meeting in early March. Um, it was an AIG offsite meeting, and uh, you know, we were getting more information about what was then called coronavirus and that there would probably be some form of sequestering and there might be an impact on the uh, economy as a result of that, um, where we might be sequestered or, or, you know, not be able to work face to face for four to six weeks. So, you know, to your point, here we are um, nine plus months later um, and, you know, we're still dealing with a lot of these issues. Um, but I think, you know, if you look at the value chain and what we do, it's, it's impacted everybody in sales and distribution um, and really the submission and, and, uh, of the application and the whole process have, have been impacted. Um, you know, a lot of logistic issues um, emerged. Um, as I said earlier, you know, some who have the more innovative um, uh, accelerated underwriting processes and digital platforms, I think have probably fared better. Uh, because, you know, just trying to figure out how do we collect the data? How do we do the underwriting? Um, you know, people weren't comfortable with having paramedics inside their home and, and even taking a pen from them to sign uh, paperwork. And, um, you know, we, we own a direct marketing organization and we learned a lot from that organization on how we could do business, how we could help our distributors sell over the phone um, and, and trying to support distributors as, as they were making the transition themselves. Um, you know, we said earlier, there's just not been anything like this in the industry in, in the time that, that we've been in it. Um, so, you know, insurers have been cautious. We've been cautious um, around underwriting standards and certain age groups. Um, it's very difficult to get coverage right now or certain um, comorbidity factors, obviously. Um, and then I think what it's really proven out is that the technology is the key going forward. Uh, because it can be used to help underwrite policies without the normal medicals. And, and um, you know, everybody's um, obviously familiar with that. But I think in a lot of ways, uh, and I referenced this earlier, it's helping expedite a, a lot of the things that needed to occur in the industry. And we, we look at it as instead of um, an evolutionary process, there's a chance here for more of a revolutionary process. Um, because first of all, and we, again, we, we learn a lot. Um, we call it our canary in the coal mine with our direct business, but we learned that there's a very increased awareness um, with consumers around the importance of life insurance. It would be interesting to run that life IQ study today post COVID um, and see if we get different results. I think it'll drive uh, different products and potentially different ways of, of distributing products. Um, I think it's, it's shown us the importance of the advisor um, and the guidance that they need to provide to the customer and, and um, the importance of the holistic planning um, and making sure there is a protection element. And then around just the processing and digitization, we need a simpler process. We've all known it, but this environment has proved that to us. Um, you know, as far as even like e-signatures, um, I saw a McKinsey study not long ago that said that 85% of agents are, are now using e-cig versus um, less than 70% in January. So, um, you know, sometimes necessity is the uh, mother of all uh, innovation and invention. And, and I think that's what's driven a lot of um, the adoption here. Um, and then really um, we've seen requests from distributors and, and consumers that they're interested in more um, self-service in, in this environment as well. Um, and then last, just really the underwriting, um, the algorithms and, and um, the creativity around some of the new external data sources um, will help create faster response um, through this whole process. But lots of great learnings um, as we've been in this environment. It's been tough, but um, for us to not 
learn and be different going forward would be um, real wasted education that we've all got to go through. Yeah, I think you're right. We're, we're, we are uh, past the, the point where we can turn back and uh, we've really got to focus on leaning into a lot of the strategies we've already already identified and, and, and try and find trying to find ways to accelerate those. To wrap things up, Mark, uh, believe it or not, we're almost out of time. Um, tell us about AIG's uh, current go forward approach to distribution. What do you see as your, your different growth initiatives? Obviously, you mentioned um, the direct marketing organization that you guys uh, own. Uh, you know, brokerage has a strong desire to, to maintain and grow relevancy. That's what uh, Nailba is really all about, the, being the voice of independent distribution. But we know we have competition. We know uh, we need to be competitive. What do you What do you see there? What do you need from us? What's your take? Yeah. So I I mean, first of all, um, we 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 benefited from having the broad distribution and and. You know, our, I think our viewpoint has been and still continues to be that we want to meet the the customer in the marketplace how they want to be met. So, you know, people want to buy in different ways and from different people. And I don't think it's even I don't I don't view it as a competition um, standpoint as much as it's an, an option standpoint. Um, and and like I said, that it has served us well um, because some channels have been more impacted during the COVID environment um, than others, and we're able to learn things about the consumer and processes and, and apply them across um, all of the businesses. You know, you, you're talking about brokerage and and the relevancy um, in in the you know on a go forward basis and in the environment we're in. Brokerage is our, is our largest and richest channel um, and has been and where we have the most history. And we want to continue uh, to grow that channel, um, you know, while we, while we also um, expand into new opportunities. I think how we view um, into how we, we remain relevant and brokerage and help in brokerage is, is a couple things. One is um, obviously bringing products that have value to the market. Um, and then two is really around this process, because if we can create a process where the advisor can move to the next customer or an advisor who hasn't done insurance before can be comfortable doing insurance because the process is easier um, and, and the intermediary, the BGA can spend more time around marketing and support and development of those agents, we think everybody wins that when you hand off the case, it gets done quick and easy versus so many of your resources having to go into to getting it through the process. I think that that's big. And then I think what we, we would ask of the distribution is to, um, first of all, give us feedback, um, but then to have an open mind as we bring different marketing programs out to you. Um, and maybe there are things you haven't done before, but, but give them a chance. So we've got a lot of things that we're looking at that we think can help BGAs going forward. Um, new ways of looking at your producers and potentially segmenting them and strategies, how to support them virtually. Um, one of the things that we did right out of the box with COVID was create a package called Navigating the New Normal that was really to try to help BGAs who hadn't been remote before, who hadn't worked remote before and leverage some of the tools that we had and insights that we had, you know, how we can take um, what we know about selling insurance over the phone from AIG Direct and and bring it out to the BGA. So we'll continue to do more of that um, and try to bring things other than just product. And our ask would be, tell us what we can do that would help you and make a difference. Give us feedback on what we are bringing out and then just um, ask for the partnership to um, embrace um, what we're bringing. Awesome. Well, uh, that was a, a ton of great information. Um, I think uh, we, we all have a, a, a very interesting next 12 months in front of us. Really appreciate uh, both your assessment of the way things are and, and some of the things to pay attention to on a go forward basis. Most of all, I wanna thank you on behalf of Nailba uh, for AIG's continued support of the organization. You know, this, is, this has been a tough year for everybody as, as you pointed out, um, but uh, you know, we, we feel this virtual environment that we're in is, is we still have to carry on. We still have to bring thought leadership uh, to the, to the NAILBA membership. And it's things like this that do that. So it's not just about the financial support, but really appreciate your willingness to jump on and yeah. share some, some thoughts. And, 
you know, 2021, a, a big year for Nelba. And uh, again, many thanks, Mark, to you. Anything you want to say before we sign off? Yeah, you bet. Um, first of all, I'm happy to um, provide any support to Nelba. I think, you know, we all miss, uh, you know, being in person, um, few, I guess what would have been a few weeks back um, and, and having the chance to, to interact um, at the annual meeting. But I, I applaud um, everybody at Nelba for the way that um, you've embraced the current environment and, and come up with a program um, to, to, that works inside the current environment and brings a lot of value. I've had a chance to participate in a lot of the sessions and, and they've been great. So um, congratulations to everyone at Nelba for a really great job and given the environment we're in. Yeah, Dan, Dan, the team's done an awesome job. I, I, I'm going to take zero credit for that. Okay. I was trying uh, to help you there. Get my, some my, my, my goal is to not drive him away over the course of the next year when I be <laughs> under, <laughs> under my tenure. But uh, they've, they've been terrific. And uh, thanks again, Mark. We'll be you talking bet. soon. All right. Take care.